So did you know that there's a group of stone pillars in Van Cortlandt Park in the Bronx that were put there in the early 1900s to test the different stone types for Grand Central Terminal? So in 1905, there was 15 different stone pillars, 10 feet tall, all placed in a row in the Bronx along one of the railroads that used to be there. There's still a railroad there, but it's a different track that is no longer there. That's now a nature trail. These stone pillars were put there to test out the different types of stone in order to figure out which ones would be used in the building of Grand Central Terminal. So at the time that these pillars were placed there, the terminal was already being built. I think it started being built in 1900 or something. And the part that they were testing these stone pillars for was for the the main building, like the outside building that's on above ground. A lot of the building before that being done was like the more complicated things below ground. So the last things to be completed were the above ground sections. Now before that, there was Grand Central Station or it was Grand Central Depot or something like that. There was like a version of Grand Central, but at the time railroads were being electrified so there was a lot more demand for like space because there were so many more people coming into the city through the railroad and they needed something to keep up with that and what was there before just wasn't cutting it. <laughs> so the reason that these stones were put up is because stone weathers differently and this is because of the minerals that are in the stone but it also depends on the environmental conditions and in a big city like New York City there's a lot of different environmental conditions that may not be the same somewhere like more rural. So they wanted to know what stone would make more sense to build a building like this, but also one that would look nice and not weather into some like ugly color or texture. So every rock weathers differently depending on its unique mineral assemblage. So for example, granite is made up of lots of feldspar and quartz and a few other minerals, and things like limestone are made up of calcium carbonate minerals. So these two things weather differently, and if you were to put the same exact type of rock in different locations, in a city versus a rural area or in the woods, they're also gonna weather very differently because of the different environmental conditions. A really good example in the difference of weathering of stones is any graveyard or cemetery. So if you go into a cemetery, you'll see a lot of the time there's the older stones and then there's the more recent headstones. And the more recent ones are usually more resilient type of rock like granite usually and the older ones are usually a marble or limestone and this is the ones that are look a lot more rough they look like a lot more weathered and sometimes you can't even see the words on them anymore this obviously has to do with the fact that they're older but they also weather quickly and more easily than something like granite does. Now, not every single granite and not every single marble or limestone is exactly the same because like I said, they all have their own unique group of minerals and the environmental conditions. So one type of limestone is not gonna weather the same exact way as a different type of limestone. I actually did a lab in college where my professor had us go to a local cemetery in a blizzard and we had to measure a bunch of different gravestones and see kind of like the difference in weathering rates. So anyway, back to the pillars. These 15 stone pillars were sent from quarries all around the country because they all kind of wanted to like compete in which one of their stones is going to end up on in Grand Central, in the head house of Grand Central. And it was a big honor if they were chosen because that means that rocks from their quarry were going to be in this really historical building that would probably last for hundreds of years. The different rocks that were put there were mostly granite. Um, and then there was, I think, one marble sample and two samples of limestone. If you'd go there today, though, there's actually only 13 pillars that are currently standing, and I couldn't really find the exact reason why, but I think it's because um, after the original 15 were put up, I think there were there might have been a couple more samples of the limestone that were like the same type of limestone and when they kept it up for historical purposes after they no longer needed them they figured that maybe that many limestone samples would be too many i'm not really sure if that's the reason but that's like the only thing i could find online about it so the stone pillars were placed here in 1905 and the head house of Grand Central Terminal was starting to be built in 1910. So these stone pillars were put here for about five years to see how they weathered in the elements outside, to see what they would look like after a few years as the 
you know, as a part of the actual building. So out of these 15 stone pillars, they ended up choosing two of the stones for the Grand Central Terminal Headhouse. One of them was a limestone called the Indiana Limestone, and the other one was the Stony Creek Granite from Connecticut. The Indiana Limestone was chosen mainly because it was durable, but it was also the cheapest option in terms of purchasing, but also transporting it, especially considering that it came from all the way from Indiana. It was also a good option because it was durable, but it also wasn't too durable in order for them to carve a sculpture out of it. This is the rock that was used in the sculpture group that's at the top of the head house. So next time you go to New York City and you see that group of sculptures at the top, that is the limestone. And then everything below that, like the main, pretty much most of the rest of the building out front is the granite. And the granite is the more durable stone here. The Indiana limestone has a very interesting history. It's actually used in a lot of buildings in New York City and also historical buildings around the country and also just like non-historical buildings across the country. A couple places that it's been used is Ellis Island, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Empire State Building, the Pentagon, and many others. And I also saw something online saying that this is the only stone that's been used in all 50 states in building material. <laughs> like I said, it's ideal because it's durable but not too durable in order to be carved into sculptures, but it also doesn't break into layers in terms of the bedding planes. A lot of sedimentary rocks have very obvious bedding planes like shale for example, but this one does not have that and it's very homogeneous so it doesn't it's easier to work with than one that breaks easily. And it came from a quarry called the Perry Matthews and Buskirk Quarry. This limestone is called an oolitic limestone, meaning that it is made up of a bunch of little sediments called ooids. They form when tiny little grains of either sand or smaller particles or even uh, fragments of shells or bones fall and then eventually calcareous sediments that are surrounding the that little fragment in the water in a shallow sea get concentrically banded around that nucleus. <laughs> that is the type of limestone that this Indiana limestone is and it was formed 330 million years ago when that part of the world was actually a shallow sea and there was a lot of marine life and not necessarily lots of land life yet. Limestone is a sedimentary rock and it's a carbonate sedimentary rock. This, I don't have a piece of limestone with me right now, but I have a piece of dolomite. And this is also a carbonate rock. You can learn more about this in my video about Herkimer diamonds. This formed in a similar way, um, but it's just a lot older and from obviously a very different location. But this is an example of a carbonate rock. Mo, step it. Get down, get down. Get down from there. You can sit there, but don't play with the plant. The other type of rock that was chosen was the Stony Creek Granite from Connecticut. And this granite was chosen because it was a lot more durable than the limestone, but it was also more expensive than the limestone. So originally I think they had planned to use it on less of the building, but they ended up using the granite for actually pretty much a majority of the building. So the shop front lower levels that is all the Stony Creek granite. This rock was formed in a much different way than the limestone, and it was also formed millions of years before the limestone from Indiana. So this was formed about 600 million years ago when the earth looked a lot more different than it did 330 million years ago when the limestone was formed. Granite is made in a much different process than limestone. It's an intrusive igneous rock. So when you think of a volcano, usually you're thinking of lava that spews out on the surface and cools there. But an intrusive igneous rock, Mo. But an intrusive igneous rock forms when magma tries to make its way up to the surface, but it stays underground and it cools there. And eventually it gets uplifted to the surface over millions of years and then eroded and exposed. This is an example of a piece of granite from Maine. And a lot of the time with granite, you'll see that it has a pinkish color. And that a lot of the time is because of a mineral called feldspar. Other minerals that are popular in granite are quartz. And quartz is actually a very resistant mineral, so this is part of the reason why granite is a very durable rock. 
The Stony Creek granite was not as highly used as the Indiana limestone in historical buildings, but it actually has been still used in a lot of historical buildings like the pedestal of the Statue of Liberty, the Smithsonian, Columbia University, the foundation of Brooklyn Bridge, and lots more. So in 1913, when Grand Central Terminal was finally finished being built and open to the public, there wasn't necessarily any practical use anymore for these stone pillars. So they were kept up for historical importance, but over the years they did undergo a lot of changes in terms of not only natural weathering from weather and other environmental conditions, but also from humans. So there was a lot of graffiti on them and other things. So in 2017, they were actually restored by Tati Art Conservation through a grant to restore them back to their fresh surface. <laughs> My cat wants to be in the video. <laughs> so yeah, they were restored in 2017 and now you can go on a nature trail in the park and go look at them yourself. They were restored back to their fresh surface. So now they can actually be weathered by the elements once again and you can maybe go there and compare them to how the stones look on the head house of the Grand Central Terminal. I hope you enjoyed learning about this place and this topic because it's something that I'm really interested in and I really wanted to share it because when I found out that this existed, that this was a thing, I got really excited. It just like reminds me of all the different connections there are in our everyday life to geology and knowing that this building was built about a little over a hundred years ago but the stones that were used to build this building are much older and a product of processes that we can barely even comprehend especially on the time scale that they happened this is just one of the many reasons that i fell in love with geology in the first place it completely changes my perspective on the world and I'm constantly learning things that open my eyes to a whole new aspect of the world I never thought about. So when I first started learning about geology, I never thought that I would be interested in the rocks that build buildings. But now it's something I think about a lot and I'm actually really interested in now learning more about the Indiana limestone and the Stony Creek granite. So I hope you learned something and as always, thank you for watching.